In retrospect, it seems really straightforward. At the time, it wasn't exactly straightforward. There are very few problems that can be solved by technology alone. First of all, you better have the ideas. You have to figure out what you're going to do. If you engineer for the hardest problem on the planet, uh, that isn't the way to make a good business. So basically, there's a lot of concern about whether there'll be jobs like the ones we have now. There won't be, because many of them will be done by machines. Historically, this started with uh, Turing. If you're interested in phenomena, say in psychology or economics, and your theory is a really mechanistic one, it's a step-by-step -step one, then computer science has something to offer because computer science says what kind of mechanisms are, are, are possible. Turing's 1937 definition of a computation in terms of a machine is not just another mathematics formulation, but it is the birthplace, really, of the abstract notion of a computer. I think it's the birthplace of our scientific discipline. The discovery of Turing's work for us was an absolutely dramatic event. We were startled by the simplicity of the model and the real intuitive appeal of this model. Actually, so my first appointment was half in math and half in computer science. And then, yes, I quickly switched to computer science, realizing the grass was greener in the computer science department, yes. And I walked in uh, in 1958 in this room full of glowing red tubes. What mesmerized me was that you could write a piece of software and it created this little universe that you were in charge of. And it did what you told it to do. Of course, the problem was it didn't always do what you wanted it to do. It did what you told it to do. And the difference between what you wanted and what you told it is called a bug. So um, I got to MIT, there were only 10 women on the faculty out of a faculty of 1,000. There was more pressure on universities to hire women. I don't think all universities were paying much attention to this, but MIT was paying attention. Doing a project, building a, a machine or a, a compiler or any of these things uh, shows up many wonderful new solutions, which are usually kind of uh, half-baked, they don't quite work, but you have to get it out and meet the schedule. And when one has a little time, then one can start to go look at it and try and build a theory behind it. I had this immensely intuitive feeling that humans are going to be able to drive a great deal of capability from this. And along with that had come very real images in my mind of sitting at a display console, interacting with a computer, seeing all sorts of strange symbology coming up that we could invent and develop <clears throat> to facilitate our thinking, and you could be collaborating in brand new exciting ways, and that you could be just doing all sorts of things to control a computer. The Alto software as a whole was very big, it was very complicated, it did not have a unified design. The general philosophy was that, that uh, anarchy should prevail so that everybody could do whatever he thought was best, and then we would find out in the course of time which things actually worked out. I sketched out the little cartoon of two kids with their laptop computers, learning about physics by making their own space war game and playing it with wireless connection between the two. From that time forward, my thought was, oh, we can change the world if we can get children to take on these larger ideas and larger ways of thinking of the 20th century. Uh, as they would take on the language early in their life. There was a mixture, a confluence of ideas, I suppose. The frustration that we didn't have access to the data that existed, even though it was there. The need for a collaborative environment so that people working together could, uh, could design something in a common shared space. I find it among many of my students that come to computer science just to make machine more powerful. But when you speak to them eye to eye, you find out that their real motivation is to understand themselves. And what is better to understanding ourselves than to emulate ourselves in a machine? Because once you emulate yourself in a machine, you can take it apart. Well, the first sentence of the paper goes something like, we stand today on the brink of a revolution in cryptography. So I, I thought about the 
you know, the subject, the social importance of it, the technical importance of it, but I didn't think of it exactly as a human activity in the way it became. Right around 1980, I remember saying, I could foresee the day when you might use an electronic funds transfer to buy a loaf of bread. I couldn't call it a debit card because we didn't have them. Computer security is actually uh, all about the interaction between uh, human beings and machines. And most of the mistakes are made by humans. And in this case, if you have the perfectly secure machine, but it is operated by people who are making mistakes, I don't think you'll solve the security problem. The move uh, away from prevention, or at least de-emphasizing prevention in favor of detection, such a strong theme. And I think uh, we in the cryptographic field have not responded adequately to that yet. If you don't have a good architectural way of dealing with this information, everything else becomes irrelevant because you can never get to it in the first place. We don't want to be dealing with a future in which you say, well, it was a, a letter from such and such to such and such of about so long and you don't know how it was stored or anything like that. But if you could say the object whose identifier is X and that identifier was uniquely tied to that digital object, you at least have a way of being specific about what you're looking for. The same argument could be made with regard to formats of, of data and uh, the ability to run old operating systems and the like. Even the ability to remember what the structure uh, of the content is, where it came from, you know, who owns it or has control over it, all of that has to be preserved. Actually, it is coming sooner than you might think, especially the last 10 years. We have enough technology so that we can go down to these little guys, to the electrons, to the atoms. We can talk to them because now we have learned their language. And we whisper in their ears. Here is the choreograph for a dance. Can you do this quantum dance for me, please? Also, if a student gets a pretty good idea, they can get support to start a company. What this means is that the students who do the most exciting research as an undergraduate or even a graduate student are very likely not to become a professor. I tell high school students I picked the perfect career for the last half of the 20th century. But if I were picking for the first half of the 21st century, I would plunge into yet more complexity and that is the interaction between computing and biology. There's all kinds of new ideas, all kinds of new implementations. It is a great time to be a DBMS researcher. And so I would encourage all of you to go out and explore this new space of, of implementations. It's relatively easy to find things by using search, and it's relatively easy to connect things by using links. This means that privacy through obscurity doesn't work anymore data about what people are doing in the physical world will be just as important as data that starts out digitally in the form of um, search histories or whatever. We should be able to make the assumption that we have privacy in private spaces, but I certainly feel like all of the information that is being kept about us everywhere can be triangulated in ways we may not know uh, and that could have harmful long-term effects. I don't think we have any privacy at all. Every time you're driving a car, your, your car numbers are there. Every time I send an email, every time I make a phone call, anything, every time I do a purchase, they're all known. And so in some sense, our privacy is no longer entirely under our own control, if it ever was. It's now dependent on what other people decide to do with the information they have about you. And I think we're going to have to live through this odd period where uh, privacy feels very eroded until we understand what uh, social norms we might want to invoke in order to reintroduce the notion of privacy. Everywhere we look, we're running into a system that is too complicated for people to use. What we need to do is put more knowledge in these computer-human interfaces and allow the interface to accept in human language what it is people want to do and then the program can just do it. If we can have systems that can harness energy from the, the body, then the chances are it'll be a, you know, something that you wear on your body and it'll be invisible you know, and uh, it'll, it'll be always on, always working, always learning.
what are really the great questions of, of mankind. Symbolic manipulation methods on a computer will allow us to penetrate those questions more deeply than any other way that we know.